Welcome to Mission 150, an audio and video podcast detailing the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's 150 years of mission involvement around the world. You can find this on the General Conference YouTube channel and also wherever you can download and listen to audio podcasts. Thanks for joining us. I'm David Trim. I'm your co-host. I'm director of the General Conference Office of Archives, Statistics, and Research. And I'm Sam Nevis, Associate Director of Communication for the General Conference. Thank you for tuning in today and listening to this story about mission. Today we're going to talk about mission to China. Michael, thank you once again for joining us today. Who is Michael, for those that don't know? Michael Campbell, we're delighted to have him with us. Join us again. We did an excellent uh, podcast with him about Abram LaRue, the first Adventist missionary to China. Uh, Michael Campbell is a much-published Adventist historian, a real expert with particular expertise on the history of China. He is the Director of Archives, Statistics, and Research for the North American Division with its headquarters in Columbia, Maryland. Michael, thank you for joining us. David and Sam, thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. Michael, in our previous episode, we talked about Abram LaRue, the first Adventist missionary to China who went to Hong Kong in 1888. Why do you think it took Seventh-day Adventists so long to send missionaries to follow up LaRue? Why did it take them so long to prioritize China? Great question. You know, I, I, I don't think there were any church leaders that were saying, you know, let's take as long as possible <laughs> <laughs> to share the Adventist message. It, it really had to do with a lack of resources, right? So lack yes. of financial resources, of, of missionaries, of personnel to actually go. And, and in terms of denominational history, the 1890s was a time of a lot of spiritual growth. We talked last time about 1888 briefly. So there's a lot of spiritual growth and theological growth, uh, but also there's organizational growth that happens. And, and a turning point, a key turning point is the 1901 General Conference session. Now, those that may not be as familiar with the history of that, when the 1901 General Conference session begins, the denomination is basically broke. Yes. And so one of the key things when the I church is that. reorganized is I like to describe it as is reorganized for mission. And, Absolutely. And so part of developing structure of conferences and unions and the general conference, all of these working together, later divisions as well, is to flow resources and to make them available for the mission of the church. So it's no accident that it's in the wake of the 1901 General Conference session that there are now new resources available to advance the mission of the church. And church leaders don't waste any time at all in trying to, trying to start strategically allocating where they see some of the needs yeah. the most. And of course, that sets the stage for our story today. Yes, I think the, the key point is that the 1890s is a period of financial difficulty in the yeah. church mm -hmm. and also of some dissension and disagreement at the topmost level of the church. People were getting on with mission, mm -hmm. but there were disagreements about how the church should be structured, mm -hmm. um, but also financial restraints that got worse and worse as the 1890s wore on. Of course, as we established in our last episode, LaRue arrives in 1888, so in a sense, he arrives at a bad time. Yeah, and and as a his, as a fellow historian, you know, David, that uh, some of that wider cultural context that's going on, that the 1890s was a time of boom and bust, and so there's a, a number of uh, depressions and economic panics that happen too. So that that makes it rather tumultuous and unstable as well. When when we restructure in mm -hmm. 1901, this yeah. would be the second big restructuring because the first we didn't have a structure. Yeah. Then we had one. Mm -hmm. And now this structure that we had was not conducive to global missions. Correct. It was right. it was designed for a church in the northeast and midwest of the United States. But God took us far beyond those territories and now we needed to 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 come together and find a, a better way. How do we go from being financially uh, in trouble and after the organization, suddenly money appears, or is it better distributed, or, uh, you know, because we're like, yeah, we're in trouble here, and then we restructure for yeah. decentralization because mm -hmm. that's that's what happens. Okay, right, we're going to be more decentralized. 
it's both decentralized and centralized, right? So yeah. uh, it's decentralized in terms of the power structure and bureaucracy, right? So up until 1901, there's just a, a small handful of people, but but part of it is that the church administration broadens. The General Conference uh, Executive Committee uh, basically doubles in size, size from 13 to 25 individuals. So that's part of it. It's also centralized in terms of having organized departments of the church. As opposed and, to these independent autonomous associations. Yeah, everyone yeah. doing their own thing. And then also it's centralized more in terms of finances and the flow of resources, which then can, can work uh, uh, together to help facilitate mission. Everybody wanted that to happen. But because everyone's doing their own separate thing, it was becoming very difficult to do that. And there's roadblocks and everything else. So so truly 1901, that general conference session was a turning point that facilitated mission. And we see in the wake of 1901, it, I mean, let's think about it. You know, church hierarchy and structure, we kind of ask ourselves, is it really... Is it really worth it? Is it useful? That kind of thing. Is it just bureaucracy and everything else? But but the church leaders got together and said, our primary purpose for organization is mission. And when the organization gets in the way of mission, then we need to do something about it. And right. that's what happened in 1901. And Sam, I think part of the answer to your question is that members have greater confidence. There'd been talk of reorganizing to to achieve this goal of being more fitted for worldwide mission for a global church for at least five years, mm -hmm. maybe even for 10 years. And nothing had happened, nothing had happened. So church members were beginning to lose confidence in yeah, the organized church and being frustrated, Michael, mm -hmm. as you rightly say. Yeah. And so part of what happens after 1901 is that people say, right, now we have confidence. And Ellen White has come back from her nine years mission work in Australia, is at the 1901 general conference session, her first general conference session for, I'm not sure how many years, but certainly at least 10. And now having met the world in, in personally, not Absolutely. Just she's been a, she's missionary. been a missionary. But she's back. She's at the general conference session. So people can say, right, this is where the Lord is leading us. So now we have the confidence to give mission, to, to increase our mission offerings, because now we believe that they're going to be used for a good purpose. These are the images, as you're describing, as both of you are describing this, I see two, two images come to mind. One is, the decisions that need to be made locally about mission need to be made locally. So let's allow power to be decentralized. At the same time, let's allow the irrigation of resources mm. to go through every part of the garden so that the whole thing right. may come up and you don't have a lot of green grass over here and over there is dead. So this is of paramount importance. And it, it seems is. to have worked because mm -hmm. the church after this restructuring absolutely blossoms in mission and, and everywhere. Yeah. In, and around the world, but including in China. Michael, LaRue was the first Adventist missionary to China. Right. Who were the first missionaries in the 20th century? Who are the ones who come out, as you've rightly said, in the wake of the 1901 GC mm -hmm. session? And when did they arrive? And given that LaRue had been a layman, mm -hmm. and indeed one of the things he asked for is to send a pastor who can baptize the people he's worked with, who was the first pastor? Well, the first pastor and his family, you might say, is Jacob Nelson Anderson, his wife, Emma, and his sister-in-law. So that's Emma's sister, Ida, uh, and her maiden, or the Emma's maiden name was Thompson, so Ida Thompson. And of course, they have their young son who also uh, goes with them as well. And so they are the first, you might say, official missionaries that make their way um, across to China in response to that call. So the Anderson family deserve to be commemorated family. for their willingness to go, not as the first pioneer missionaries, but as the first missionaries funded and sustained by the church. Yeah, you might say official missionaries in a sense, in that mm -hmm. they had the imprimatur, not that it wasn't, Abram LaRue wasn't supported because he was, and we talked about that, but but yeah, we the, the church has now seen enough of a catalyst and an opportunity here. Let's follow that up. And we now have the resources to do it. And we have the, both the personnel and the financial resources. They can go. This is has the, it's sort of a, a maturing, a slow, gradual maturing of these initial seeds that have been planted. And when do they arrive? They arrive. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> February 2, I have to look at my notes here. February 2, 1902, they, um, after 29 days traveling across the Pacific Ocean, by the way, the early 
their earliest Adventist missionaries, that, talking about them and, and others that will come soon after them, they talk about the voyage across the Pacific was so arduous hmm. that when they left as missionaries, they weren't going and saying, you know, I'm going to go for a year, maybe two years, or maybe five years. It was a lifetime commitment. They were going expecting never to come. Right. And they sort of oh, wow. half-jokingly said that the voyage was so arduous that no one ever wanted to go back either. <laughs> and But this is true for, for of, of all the, the, the missionaries who get sent out in the early 20th century. Mm. Many of them are not expecting to come back, and that's partly because of the presence of tropical diseases, mm -hmm. which at that time medicine doesn't understand. There are no known cures. And for many of them, they do give their lives out there. Not the Andersons, as it happens, they live and do return. They're fortunate. They do return to the they States. Do. But this, this attitude, we're going and it's a one-way trip, was, was very common. The and people were this. right to, do, to, to think of it that way because for many it was. Were there people lining up for mission, or, or that's was the this... amazing thing, Sam? You know, because this is a death. It's a death sentence almost. You know, there's and disease. Certainly, the potential. Many missionaries die. You have a whole book about missionaries that that, that died suffered, prematurely. Died. Yes, yeah. yes. So it, it and they heard those stories. Right? Absolutely. The reason we can reconstruct them. The reason I was able to write a book about missionary sacrifice is because very often the illnesses are reported in the church press. They write back to church leaders and say, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so is suffering badly. And then they write an obituary. And this is in an era when most people subscribe to the church's paper and read it. And so everybody's going to be reading about these horrible sufferings. And they don't hold back. Very often, you know, they'll say after a week of the most intense agony, um, Brother Smith or Brother Jones or Sister Smith, you know, finally passed away. But there's no shortage of people ready to go as their replacement. So it's not that people are ignorant of the fact that going as a missionary can be a death I have, sentence. I have a, They know, but they're still willing to go. I, I thought about this. It, I don't know. Maybe you agree or disagree, but it seems that young people in particular are more excited by that which is difficult than that which is easy. Mm. At that time, it was difficult. Yeah. It's a great sacrifice. It's hard. It's mission impossible. Mm -hmm. Because you may spend your whole life and indeed die there and not see many churches, indeed many converts, many, many people who believe this Advent message. Yeah. And yet you had people doing it. In the last annual council, we heard here at General Conference that we are not sending as, much, as many missionaries as we used to in the past. Correct. Have we made it too easy? And, and am I to blame for this? Because I'm, I'm involved in digital evangelism. <laughs> and the message that we give is, listen, look, you don't need to go to other lands. You just use your phone and you can be a missionary. Have we made it too easy? Have we taken away from the sacrifice and therefore turned it into a less desirable, somehow less desirable thing? I don't know. It's a rhetorical question, I suppose. But... Well, but I think encouraging the answer is no, because we have many more young people volunteering to serve as actual missionaries, not digital missionaries, then we have positions that for them. To, then we have positions for them to fill. So at the moment, our young people are being inspired and they're wanting to commit. And the organized church, we need to do better at making the most of their enthusiasm. At the moment, the, the bottleneck is actually coming with the organized church. Praise the Lord for that. Well, not that there's the bottleneck. I'm, I mean, I'm hoping there will always be a bottleneck. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But we need to move faster in creating more positions, and hopefully that will inspire even more people. Right. The yeah. opposite is, is the tragedy, right? We have 200 positions open this week, but only three people applied. Right, and that, that's not that, the case. No. Yeah. Please. And I, I think you're right that young people want a challenge too, right? And so as God leads, you know, uh, and this is where we see that. This, this is a young couple with the sister, you know, that they go as an intrepid how missionary old, band. How old was, he, was Anderson when he went? Let's see. He was born in 1867, so what, 35, right. roughly, yep. you know, when he arrives there. Family. Yeah, mm -hmm. so young family. They have their oldest child. And it's interesting. You read some of the early accounts of them preparing. You know, we realize that this is a one-way trip. At least that's their expectation. So we need whatever supplies that we can, can get. And so um, some early... Adventists that are there um, in the, they're from, I mean, the Andersons were Danish immigrants, but they had lived mostly in Wisconsin. So they actually visit family. They go to Chicago, they go up to Battle Creek, 
and they're preparing. And so people are excited. The church is rallying around them. Do you need supplies? Can, how can we help you? There's some church members that buy them a camera. So we eventually will have early a number of early photographs of That's the media work. Media, media, investment. media investment. Media investment. Sam. When they actually get there, there's the first official baptism of the people that, that Abram LaRue had prepared, these sailors, right? And so we actually have a picture of that. That's thanks to that donation of that camera. Wow. Uh, someone else gives them a bicycle. Someone else gives them some other kinds of things that they then pack with them in their crates uh, the, the, and take with them across the ocean. I presume they didn't have a 50-pound limit per bag uh, <laughs> <laughs> on the ships. Yeah, right. I, yeah, they, but, but they brought it with them. That's mm -hmm. the important point. Yes, and yes. so they get there, and, and this becomes a key turning point. They, they take some time preparing, but, but they, they make a way and respond to the call. Now, one thing I think it's very interesting, we've talked about 1901, but I also think it's really important that we mention the fact that this, this is happening in the wake of the Boxer Rebellion. Right. And indeed, in some ways, perhaps the delay is a little bit providential. What is the Boxer, the Boxer Rebellion? Rebellion was an uprising against the Western powers who were beginning to dominate China. And it was an uprising, not least against Western missionaries and their converts. Uh, and, and many missionaries did die. Many missionaries were killed. Many local Chinese converts were killed. So had Adventist missionaries gone earlier, they would have had to flee to safety. Mm -hmm. And local converts, even the missionaries, might have well have been, been killed. So maybe there's even a plus side to, the, I mean, the whole 14-year delay is too long. We yeah. can say that with hindsight Absolutely. and the benefit of hindsight. Yeah. But if they were going to send them, if there was going to be a delay, then waiting until 1902 rather than 1899 is no, when the Boxer Rebellion breaks out in 1900. Maybe it's not such a bad thing. Maybe there's a providential aspect to it. Yeah, I just imagine if they'd gone into the mainland of China, they, they, this in, intrepid band would have been potentially wiped out. I mean, they were expecting that they put, could potentially. They're putting their life on the line. Uh, but there does seem to be a, an wow. element of providence in terms of the yeah. timing here. And just to, you know, this may be something we can cover in a, a podcast in the future. There were missionaries to China who were murdered by bandits um, all the way up until sort of 1950. Banditry is an endemic problem in, the China, in, in China. And there were Adventist missionaries who were murdered. Um, so yeah. even though the Andersons know that the Boxer Rebellion is over, they probably don't know that everything is as peace. They don't, nobody at that stage is quite sure how peaceful it's going to be. In fact, actually, yeah. Westerners were then quite safe uh, for a number of years, but they, but they couldn't have known that. But they yeah. went into mainland China, right? They went to Hong Kong. They, they didn't Hong go Kong. to mainland China. He will begin to make forays into mainland China very soon afterwards. And that's kind of the next step of the story. Or who are some of the other missionaries that go, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if it's taken 14 years between, yeah. sending, between LaRue going himself and mm -hmm. then sending the Andersons yeah. and um, Thompson, how long did it take before more missionaries followed them? Well, that's a great question, and I think part of it is answered. It's 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 twofold, right? So, um, and one is is that not only does our church send missionaries, but but there are other missionaries who are there. And in this case, there was another missionary family by the name of Eric and Ida Pilquist, who had been Swedish uh, missionaries. They had been immigrated to the United States, had gone on to China as missionaries, worked with the Bible Society, the British, the, the British, the British Bible that's right, society, and yeah. and so he's there. He learns the language, and interestingly enough, he travels back to the States. Now, we know that there was some evidence that he had been exposed to the Adventist message before this, Yes, but it clearly, when he comes back on that, I guess they would have called it a furlough, right? Mm -hmm. When he's back in the States, he visits the church headquarters. There's sort of a, it seems to me, like kind of a rekindling of that relationship, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's also while he's back in the States, that he actually meets the Andersons who are preparing to go. And so there seems to be almost, again, another providential time element where, oh, here's some experienced missionaries, and they are excited about the Adventist message too. And so there's this moment in which the a converging of, of, of right. persons, wow. and that when they go back over to Hong Kong, and of course the Pilquists go back, that there's this relationship that's established. And now they go back as Adventist missionaries, because unlike with Hannah Moore, who we looked at in one of our early episodes of the podcast, mm -hmm. who goes to Africa herself, and nobody at Battle Creek 
has the boldness to say, we've already got an Adventist on the West Coast, let's make her our missionary. Mm -hmm. And she ends up coming back. Uh, this By this time, which is, you know, almost 40 years later, the church says, ah, we've got an experienced missionary. He's no longer going to be able to work for his old employers because he's now an active Seventh-day Adventist. We will send him as one of our missionaries. But Michael, isn't it also the case that there were missionaries who arrived in October 1902, Edwin and Susan Wilbur, who were both nurses, I think? Absolutely. And that's where I was headed to next is because, um, again, reinforcements, and now there's the resources. And so the Andersons are running back. And of course, uh, Abram LaRue dies within a short amount of time after they get there. In fact, there's a great story. When, when they show up, <laughs> they arrive in Hong Kong. And they're like, uh, they had corresponded with Abram LaRue. And they're like, how do we find this guy? Right. And they're a little bit lost. And, and apparently there was some miscommunication. So um, Abram LaRue wasn't able to find them. And they kind of missed each other. And eventually they ask around, is there some missionary, this Adventist missionary, this Abram LaRue, and eventually they find a sailor who knows who he mm. is, take him to his little uh, uh, place on uh, 3 Arsenal Street, I think it was. Mm. Uh, and, and, and so here Abram LaRue goes out and looks for them, and then he comes back, and there they are in his living room in his little apartment. <laughs> And so there they are, and uh, no she recalls, about phones, right? Yeah, <laughs> she, I'm, just talk, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually, there's a lot of great stories like that. The earliest missionaries. I mean, who? How do you? The point of contact and, yeah. and right. miscommunication or lack of language or lack of you know ships can be delayed and don't arrive when they're supposed to or whatever. Right. And that's that's what happened days. there. Twenty nine days. Twenty nine right? days, and and so they eventually do find. Um, and so there's an interesting account of them trying to find Abram LaRue. You know, they're kind of worried and they eventually get on these, I guess today we'd call them, what, the rickshaws? Uh, yep. you know, they, mm -hmm. they finally make their way. They're there and uh, they find Abram LaRue. But, but soon that the, um, these additional reinforcements that you mentioned, and not just the Wilbers, uh, but also you have another group of missionaries that are responding to the call of Anderson and Pilquist saying, Hey, we 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 have some missionaries established on the shore of Hong Kong, so they're just on the other side of mainland China. But what about up in South Central China, which is where Pilquist had done a lot of his missionary work? Right. And so you have yet another, and so within a short amount of time, within about eighteen months, you have um, a series of missionaries that all go in quick succession to one another wow. in establishing an Adventist presence right. on mainland China. And mm. whereas LaRue never works in mainland China, he visits yeah. it, but he never does witnessing there, partly because yeah. he can't speak Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, as you say, within 18 months, you have a progression. You have the Andersons who arrive in, the Ho in Hong Kong. You have the Wilbers arrive, mm -hmm. who fairly soon move to Guangzhou, the big city on the mainland. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Pilquist, who goes back to the inland area where he'd worked before. Mm -hmm. So Adventism, having for 14 years been restricted to the, the coast and, and, and the island off the, the, yeah. the shore of, of China, in 18 months has made a big commitment to reaching all of China. Obviously, they haven't gone to all of China yet, but the trajectory is there. Yeah, and, and I think there's a significant shift that happens here. And it's, it, you know, uh, Abram LaRue had tried to translate this literature into Chinese and everything else, but he didn't learn the language. And so it's almost like he gets a foothold there. But then the Andersons do l learn the Chinese language. And of course, Pilquis already knew they were fluent in the Chinese language. And, and these the, all these other missionaries that come in quick succession, they learn the language and they are indigenizing the Adventist message in a way so that they're not just looking for British sailors, although it's important to evangelize them too, which is the primary kind of audience that, that, that um, LaRue. Abram LaRue was relating to, but now it's going to the actual Chinese people that are there, the different people groups, and trying to find ways to take the Adventist message and truly um, establish a foothold now, not just in Hong Kong, but on the mainland. And this, and this is where Adventism begins to blossom. It just takes off. Right. It seems to be a trend even from the first century. You know, Paul would always go to the synagogue. He would mm -hmm. connect with mm -hmm. those that were closest to him mm -hmm. before he moved on to the locals, let's say, to the indigenous. Yeah. yeah. And to the Greek speaking. The Greeks, yeah. yeah. So you find that, uh, that to be the case mm -hmm. um, with all missionaries. I mean, where else are you going to start? Yeah. You know, you start yeah. with those that are like you. Yeah. Who you have a connection with. And who you're most capable of communicating mm -hmm. with, yeah. uh, both in language and else in, in culture. And and I think it's important to also note who, you know, you have the Wilbers and then you have Pilquist, but then you have this next 
invasion, shall we say, in the best possible sense of the word of, of sending waves and quick succession of, of missionaries, but, but they go together as a group. So it's not just a family, but as a group. And that is um, uh, uh, Harry and Maud Miller. Harry Miller will be very famous for as a medical missionary, but, but it's interesting. They sent a, a, a couple of pa- a, a pastor and family, then they sent some nurses and then they send some physicians and nurses. It's and a team. Yes. It's, it's a team this effort. Is team evangelism. And, and so they're looking at how do we reach the people? And it's worth saying, not only is Harry Miller a medical missionary, but Maud, his wife, was also a physician. And she is one of the ones that's a good example of what you described. Now, she wasn't murdered. There are some misunderstandings about what happened. She actually got gravely ill of a tropical disease. Yes. Or not sure what it was, but a tropical disease. And she, uh, tragically, um, she does give her life. She And as she's on her within deathbed... A fairly, within a couple of years of yeah, arrival, she gets... Uh, very she short time. illness and, and dies. And, and she's pregnant, yeah. actually. They lose their baby. Yes. Uh, and so it's, it's oh just goodness. terrible tragedy. And yet, as she's on her deathbed, um, she has these words of, you know, I give my life to the Chinese people and the work of China and encouraging her fellow missionaries to continue pressing on, to continue challenging her husband, look for Jesus and the resurrection, do everything you can to share the Adventist message. Just beautiful words of wow. hope. And he buries her. She doesn't want any fanfare, just with the with the other Chinese people who she loves in her Chinese clothes. So she's she's um, she she sees herself as not and, and this is this is important because I think some in missionary history that the missionaries came in a culturally in air, an aura of cultural superiority, mm-hmm. and and I don't see that now. It's not to say that our missionaries were perfect and didn't have any prejudices and biases mm-hmm. and everything else, but you see this very clearly with Maud Miller that that she has internalized the language and the culture and That's admires right. and loves the people. And even in her death, she says, I want to be buried with the people that I'm serving, that I love. That's beautiful. Adventist missionaries, yes. I mean, there's no question that some of them had prejudices. And we know this because uh, church leaders write about it and speak about it. Mm-hmm. So there's no question mm-hmm. but that but some of them have prejudices and just can't work effectively in a different culture. And there's no training back then. There's no mission institute, which missionaries today go through to give them Mm -hmm. cross-cultural sensibility and competences. But actually, those missionaries are relatively few. And most Adventist missionaries, I would say, um, are effective partly because they love the people that they're working for and who they're living among. And Adventists are very good at going out and working among people. And... That's part of the reason for Adventist success. I mean, why else would they be willing to sacrifice at all, right? Well, if you know, not for, s- for love. I mean, it's not like status or wealth. For some people, though, it's, it's, it's probably an ideological thing. God is calling me to be a missionary. This is what I have to do. Um, and they bring a degree of, of inflexibility and, and, and arrogance to it. Yeah, these poor, uncivilized, yeah. ignorant mm-hmm. people that just need my... Uh, culture to yeah. reform them and make them into something, some kind of civilized kind of thing. And and by the way, I you know I was just at a, a church history academic conference, which you know, David, and I was talking to another mission historian, right? And and we're kind of comparing notes, and he said, well, yeah, we see a lot of this these cultural prejudices, but they come from a different tradition, and I don't want to. Uh, I'm not going to say because I don't want to reflect negatively in another mm-hmm. tradition. Mm-hmm. But he said, you know, when I look at your Adventist missionaries, I see far less of this cultural superiority than mm. in my particular religious tradition. And so... That's a great testimony. It is. And I, I, I thought that encouraged me because as a historian, you see sometimes the shortcomings and you realize when you actually compare, you know, actually, um, it's not always as bad as someone might think. That's in fact, right. quite the opposite. And, and that's where I think this is a beautiful thing. And by the way, we're talking about Anderson here, right? And his family. 1927, fast forward a little bit. And of course, we know the story eventually... After about a decade, his wife's health is so bad that they do have to return to the States, and he'll be a lifelong religion teacher in the States. Right. And yeah, this is the other thing. No. Not everybody dies, but a lot of people can become so ill that they have to go home. Yeah. Even Harry Miller, for a time, gets sprue, which is a horrible yeah. disease, mm-hmm. and his life was almost despaired off. They sent him back to the States. Mm-hmm. He recovered and went back to China. 
And so, yeah, yeah um, it, it, Ida Anderson is, is, has to go back. But fortunately, her yeah. life is spared. Yeah. So fast forward just a little bit to 1927. There's what's called the Nanjing Incident, right? So that it's one of these uprisings and a lot of foreigners, um, not a lot, but some foreigners are killed. And there's sort of this uh, anti-Western sentiment and so on. And, and our Adventist missionaries get caught up in the fray of all of that. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's a miraculous story. It's worth an episode, by the way, just by itself. But yeah. this, this story of, of their providential deliverance. But, but in writing about this, of course, Anderson's very connected to the work in China and writing to the missionaries. He's friends and raising funds for the work in China because he, he can't be there himself anymore because of his wife's, wife's health and eventually she dies. But he writes a very moving editorial in which he has a, these uh, self-reflection in which he says, you know, I, I repent of of, uh, and he's thinking of the uh, Boxer Rebellion, mm. because when he first comes, he's like, well, yeah, these people that killed all these people, these foreigners, they should be punished and everything else. And and here he has a reflection now 25 years later, which mm. he said, you know, we need to be more, and I'm using my own words here now, but we need to be basically, how I read it, is more culturally sensitive mm. and more more um, more careful and the Boxer Rebellion will have these steep reparations and payments, and that creates some um, hardships for a lot of the Chinese people. And he realizes that there is a cause and effect. And as missionaries, he's making an appeal that we have to be very, uh, I don't know the best way to put this, but politically neutral. Basically, here's all of these Western political and military powers, and then the local powers. We need to focus on the message itself and try our best to be neutral when it comes to these other kinds of things because we don't want it to hamper the beautiful Adventist message that we have. It is so it is so good to know that doing this today is so easy to be absolutely away from all politics anywhere that we find ourselves. Right. <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, it's we, we're living in very politicized, very polarizing times. Yes. And I, I've been meditating on this recently. If you're a missionary, mm -hmm. everything you say can be taken seriously as the opinion of whatever it is that you're teaching. Pastors had a pulpit. Now everything they say in every social media platform everywhere, it's taken with the same effect as the pulpit, except that we can record it and look back and see. Mm -hmm. And these, take it out of context. And take it out of context. Mm -hmm. In these polarizing times, it's becoming increasingly difficult to be what you're describing that he came to the conclusion we need to not be on one side or the other or pull it aside and just preach. Mm -hmm. But he is a foreigner. By just that fact, how can he communicate without communicating, uh, without taking sides in a polarizing situation? I don't know. I, I, that, well, does he come to any conclusion or wisdom for us? <laughs> obviously, it's not easy to do that, right? It's, it's, these are, are, this is obviously the, always the perpetual missiological challenge and it brings up the question of incarnation, right? I mean, this is right. what Jesus did for us. He, he became human to share the gospel message. And missionary work at its best isn't coming along and saying, oh, I'm better than you. No, in fact, it's the opposite. It's following the example of Jesus to be incarnate, to be incarnational, to take the, their, um, to, to allow their previous culture, and this is not always possible, but to, to as much as possible um, to surrender that in a way, to incarnate oneself and love the people and the culture and the customs and the most successful Adventist missionaries. And again, we have examples where it didn't work well, but the ones that were successful, and I think we're looking at some good examples of that, they're the ones that come in and say, we love and admire the people of China and here are problems and, and they fall in love with the people here, right? Mm. Um, one, of, one of the, the stories here, we're, we're talking, for example, we talked about the, the, the Millers and the Selmans who are missionary physicians. Another couple, both the man and the wife are, are both, mis are both physicians. Couples, yeah. Two couples that are physicians, but they also take with them two single women. Sometimes we don't always tell the story of the, the single right. missionary women, and their names were Charlotte Simpson and Carrie Erickson, um, and they signed up to go too. You know, and They don't have necessarily a husband or anything else. They just say, we want to go and serve, and they go. They they will actually be part of a mission station. The two ladies themselves doing mm. nursing work. They will go, and they will actually at one point they see um, that you know in times of economic disparity and everything else that that sometimes that that some children would be orphaned and left out to die. 
you know, there was no social structure. And so they found one of these infants that was left outside the gate, abandoned, obviously just waiting for it to die. They said, we can't live with ourselves and see that happen. And so they took that child wow. and adopted it and made it their own, started raising it. And actually, they describe how that was a very moving moment because they realized these missionaries aren't just coming here right. to superimpose, but they're here they see a child literally dying and and they will take it as their own. Now, they weren't the only missionaries to do that. And so That's right. there were some misunderstandings, cultural misunderstandings um, in other places where that did happen. But this is an example of where it worked well. And when they took that child in and loved it and it survived, they said, oh, they're not just kind of trying to kill these children or or there, there were even rumors that missionaries were eating these children. That's I mean, right. It, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And so they're actually saying, oh, no, they didn't eat. They, they, they didn't loved eat the child. They made it their own. In fact, this created a missionary conundrum because those two girls, those young women, will become very ill and have to return back. And they want to take the child with them. They can't. They don't get no. permission to sure. take the child with them. And so the Selmans will stay for quite a bit longer. And they actually take that child and adopt that child as their own. They continue to raise it. And so that, that, but the missionaries there, that group, they described that that was a turning point in how the people in the village where they were in that little town treated and related to them. It's, and, it's not just propaganda for a religion. Yeah, it's, they it's really were, they yeah. were serious. So Michael, just wanting to get, step back a minute. We've talked about the Andersons. We've talked about Edwin and Susan Wilbur, who were nurses. We've talked about Harry and Maud Miller and mm -hmm. Arthur and Bertha Salmon, mm -hmm. all of whom were doctors, mm -hmm. and Charlotte Simpson and Carrie Erickson, who are both nurses. Right. So what that means is that within 18 months, you have four doctors and four nurses all in China. So medical mission has really been well established very quickly. What about other typical Adventist cutting-edge mission ministries? What about, say, publishing and education, for example? Well, absolutely. I mean, going back to Abram LaRue, he has some tracts and has those translated in a small quantity that are printed. Uh, but, but it's really when Harry Miller goes over, he cast a vision that we could do a lot more if we had a press of our own. And so he actually uh, raises funds to, to secure a small little uh, hand press that right. then becomes the focal point of some of their missionary work there in in South Central China, where where they are doing that, and in very in quick succession, they they translate and develop a number of items that that including a hymnal. I think that was actually one of the very right. earliest things they translate. So that shows you again taking the Adventist message and in an incarnational way, take you know translating the 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 beautiful. Adventist hymns, and also they begin to make new hymns of their own too, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this, right. this this symbiotic kind of relationship. But as as Adventism and and the the Chinese culture kind of engage in in an incarnational way, meet one another, and so they also begin a periodical. They print other tracts, and and so this becomes not only the health, but a kind of a publishing arm, and and so you have, uh, and of course you have the the the. Um, you also have an educational aspect where uh, Ida Thompson, mm. she will, along with the Wilbers, develop uh, a school for both uh, girls right. and boys Great. down in uh, near Hong Kong and then in what was known as Amoy, just nearby, very close by. And so that, that becomes um, sort of three branches. You have the health, you have the, the publishing, you have the educational, and these will become major branches of Adventism, of the missionary impetus across China. And incidentally, I mean, I, I, as you're doing going through this podcast, I'm sure you know it's sort of the same sort of pattern that you see in other parts of the of the world as Adventism spreads to yes. different regions, different places. But certainly, you most definitely see that happening here in China. So the pattern is the co-porting, then medical missionaries, then education, mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, and even evangelism it, too. I guess you directly. could say so. Mm -hmm. It could be fourfold. And how soon does the mission start to indigenize? How soon do you actually get Chinese people working for the church, engaged in ministry? Absolutely. So almost from the very beginning. Mm. So uh, you know, Anderson's there, and there's actually some missionaries all the way down in Mal Mal what we today call Malaysia, who um, they go back on furlough. They will um, discover the Adventist message. They come back, and it's one of their previous converts from their pre-Adventist 
evangelism is a young man by the name of Timothy Tay. And Timothy Tay will go up to China to learn the Chinese language to go back and reach Chinese peoples in, in Malaysia and Indonesia. Hmm. And while he's there, he has discovered the Adventist message now, and he's discovered the Sabbath. And while he's studying the language, he will convert his teacher, Pastor K, and they hear about the Andersons in Hong Kong. So when they have a break from school, they go and say, hey, let's go, <laughs> let's sail down over to Hong Kong, meet this Adventist missionary. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, uh, through that relationship, they're baptized and, and they will become the first indigenous Adventist pastors. Of course, Pastor K will stay in mainland China. Timothy Tay will go back to uh, Malaysia, Malaysia and Indonesia and, and those places. So almost as soon as the Andersons get out there, I think it actually surprises and takes uh, the Andersons a little bit by surprise uh, because he's kind of almost a little bit skeptical. In fact, it's because of, he writes back, I met this these these, these young, um, these seem, you know, it says both some positive things, but also some, he's, he's obviously very skeptical. And I think that's mm. because of that skepticism. Remember, we talked about everyone has their prejudices, right? And sure. so um, he, 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 you can see that kind of coming through a little bit here. But, but in the end, both of them will go on to make a significant impact in their respective places. And then very quickly, there will, they will in turn do evangelism, become very successful in several, influence a number of others that will accept the Adventist message, including um, others that will become ministers as well, further expanding the Adventist message. Michael, this has been great. We could keep talking for ages, but we need to draw to a close. Obviously, we need to have you come back so we can talk about the next steps that happen in China. But as you look back on these early days of Adventist mission in China, what really strikes you? What is the takeaway that you'd like to leave with our listeners? I think there's an element here of providence. As we've talked about this, the timing, uh, both with the, the Boxer Rebellion or whatever you want to call that, um, the, the missionaries, the missionaries meeting other missionaries at just the right moments, like the Pilquist going back, right. uh, all of these things kind of coming together. And then Timothy Tay, uh, it, it, it seems almost a little bit beyond belief in a way that, that all of these people would, would meet. But I, I truly believe, you know, I'm a historian, so we tend to just describe the facts. These are the actual mm. facts. But, but as an individual, as a person, as a person of faith, I look at that and say, you know, there, there is a, a divine hand of providence that you see at work that God was clearly allowing different opportunities that, that therefore, um, as those opportunities arose, that, that the Adventist message was able to, uh, to, to make a headway in a way that seems um, uh, against all odds. And, and Adventists were kind of latecomers to the Pro Protestant missionary uh, That's the, right. in, in China and everything else, but they very quickly make up for lost time. And I, I do believe um, on a very deep personal level that, that God was working, preparing and making these connections, allowing these connections to happen that therefore in due time um, was able to, to prosper and, and many people were able to um, uh, be baptized and, and, and indigenize the Adventist message and it began to quickly spread like wildfire. Michael, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing all of those incredible insights about our church history and mission in Asia. If you've been watching this, you're interested in mission, and we just went back all the way to Abram LaRue in the last episode and all the missionaries that followed him in China and therefore Asia. Would you be able to trace where your family, you or your family heard the Adventist message? And what about those that brought it to you? At some point, you will go back to a group of disappointed people that went back to the study of scripture and found new life and a message of hope for the whole world. We pray you will be inspired by that same message to spread this to more people so that we can get it through every human being alive. We thank you for listening. We'll see you next week.